So why, why don't I turn over to Vandana? I think the goal of this session, there's a ton of expertise in this room. Uh, and so I think the, the goal of the session is to sort of help unearth both practical ideas for ways that people can push this movement forward. You know, that I heard funding sort of come up a lot. And so we can talk about that if folks have ideas and questions around federal sources of funding, state, and others. We can also talk about policy questions, like key, key enabling challenges. And then, you know, things that are ready for prime time, you know, things that you want to share with your colleagues, something that's going big in one state that you want to bring to others. So it's both a little bit of a learning session, but then also kind of an opportunity recognition session. But why don't we first start with Vandana? You know, you know, I'm sure these are lots of people that you and Kostov have talked about on the phone, so bringing all this community together is exciting. You know, if you want to give some overall thoughts on how we can use this time really no, just, just as I said yesterday and again during the session today, um, the secret agenda of Crossroads this time is collaboration. We are at a point where uh, let's start to be optimistic that funding will eventually come through. So how may we better work together uh, and look ahead as we look ahead. What can we do and what can, how can we collaborate collectively and learn from each other? That's the number one goal for us here. Um, you know, if you look at the history of evolution and how scientists interacted with each other, progress was made for humanity um, because of scientific discoveries across borders. And scientists have always collaborated. You know, we have seen further by standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, so let's, you know, we are at that point in this, if you look at this CS for All as a mission, as a change effort, we are at that point where we need to start collaborating more actively. And I'm sure efforts have been going on in the past as well, but let's uh, do that a little bit more, uh, in, in a little bit more focused effort. So what I wanted to do, because funding came up a couple of times, is put a couple of our funding sources that are in the room on the spot for what, what is it that goes through your head as you hear a pitch <clears throat> and what is the decision criteria for what makes for an actionable idea that you can follow up on and say, let's talk more. And I will go, I will engage in that as well as like, what makes for a good ask for somebody who works at the White House. So Vandana, there are folks in this room that you guys are already interested in uh, supporting. There, I'm sure there are folks who are like, pitching you and Kostov on lots of ideas. What makes for an actionable idea that is good where you're like, uh, okay, let's have the next conversation and what uh, and you know, when you're giving people mass feedback on, think about it some more and make that one pager better, what's that little bit of feedback you can give this group? Well, the number one thing that we'll be looking forward to in our grants going forward is how can you come and make a proposal to us that's a collaborative proposal. We'll put an extra weightage on anything that comes our way, which is a collaborative effort between more than one organization. Because I think we can all learn from each other. If you look at organizations, nonprofits that are working um, with, the, with the underprivileged and underrepresented groups as boot camps, I'm sure there's a lot of learning that can be shared across them on how to um, you know, maximize um, participation by students from diverse groups and how to, you know, what their lessons are and what they teach, whether it's Ruby or Python or whatever it is. Um, and then, of course, you know, as I said in the session yesterday, as an organization, we just don't want to sit there and write checks. We want to come up with, um, think out of the box, think out of the box, uh, new ways of solving problem. You know, there isn't a precedence for how computer science was ever taught at the scale, at the depth and the breadth that we are hoping to accomplish now. So I think there's a lot of room for innovative and creative ways of approaching problem solving. And don't hesitate, um, you know, even if it sounds like a crazy moonshot idea, uh, we just might take it. That's great. So Jan, as, uh, as one of the principal funders uh, uh, for CS, you know, NSF both invests a lot in this area, but you know, there are particular ways that one uh, gets into the NSF wheelhouse. What are your advice for this room for how to get involved with NSF as people want to come up with ideas? Research. We don't want to necessarily make things better for for your school or for um, for your environment. We want to learn from what you're doing to uh, so we can, as a community, build on the stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before, right? So any project must have a research or very strong evaluation component so that we know what we've learned by the time the project is done. We're also interested in things that are sustainable. Right? You can do amazing things with kids with a ton of money, but that's not going to spread across the country to all schools. So we'd like something that's sustainable. 
and we'd like something that's scalable, right? And so to be scalable, to be really scalable, you have to understand what it is about what you're doing that needs to scale, right? It can't just be, oh, I'm doing this, it works, and now I'm gonna do it in a thousand places. What, it, what are you actually doing? So that, again, requires research and evaluation. Um, we don't fund anything in computer science education, or I don't. There are other parts of NSF that fund work. But we don't fund anything from my programs that don't involve equity as an intentional uh, part of the project. So we're not interested in perfecting computer science for the 30% of people who are already taking computer science. We're really interested in what about those people who have not yet been engaged. So those are the components with what we're looking for. Um, we're doing a lot of work at the high school level now around teacher professional development. Um, we're doing a lot of research in the K-8 level around what are the appropriate things to be teaching at different levels. And um, so we actually fund quite a bit of stuff. The $120 million is actually a big boost to our, um, to our agenda for the next uh, probably four and a half years. That's great. Rosa, so uh, Corporation for National Community Service is a new player uh, in supporting CS. You know, what are ways that organizations can, uh, can work with CNCS? So that's great. So I'll focus on two things. One is our commitment to the CS for All initiative in which we're committing, and I'll say in this case it's really a, it's a challenge to other corporations to join us in a partnership to make, get this off the ground, and that is to support teacher training um, by using national service as a strategy in which individuals would serve in a community, get trained for CS, do some service in school, out of school, and in return for that would get a post-service education award. Um, the Corporation for National Community Service is known for its programs like AmeriCorps. For those of you who are familiar with Teach for America, City Year, Citizen Schools, those are all programs that we like to say are powered by national service. So our first way is to help us think through who and how might want to join us in that partnership challenge to get the $17 million that we've committed to teachers um, focused on education awards. How can we get that off the ground? So that's the first thing. Um, not all of you sitting here probably are in a position to actually say, hey, Rosa, we have money. We'd like to join you to make that vision a reality. So let's focus on the second thing, which is, um, oh gosh, maybe now a couple of years ago at the, at, the, um, at the White House Science Fair, um, the president announced what we're calling STEM AmeriCorps. Um, and for us, STEM is inclusive of computer science. Um, and what we are trying to do is AmeriCorps members, uh, we happen to be in about one in 10 school, public schools in one of four of the lowest performing schools, which means we're placing national service participants in the right places. If we want to have and work with underrepresented populations, we need to make sure that we're serving those areas, and so we are. We've been in the in education space for a really long time. It's our largest investment um, of who we're funding and where they're serving is in schools. Um, so what we wanted to do is put an emphasis to say we're looking for programs focusing on STEM. Uh, we had a large, I would say, a, a gr big group of projects first uh, Maker Ed, um, US 2020, a lot of folks who are working on this space that, that we are funding. We're hoping to continue to grow and scale that. I just learned of one in Flagstaff. Flagstaff is calling themselves STEM City. Um, and they are working on this big effort which has business, government, and higher ed all working together on this big initiative. And they were finally saying we want to use national service members to help us move our agenda. Um, we can talk more, but Corporation for National Community Service, STEM AmeriCorps, we're looking to fund programs, replicate, scale, grow, um, so we can bring um, that kind of work forward. That's great, that's great. So I'll say on, on sort of, uh, on our level, so you know, the White House Office of Science Technology Policy works for the President, and we work with our federal partners and the federal agencies I would say there's three types of ways, three types of information that are immensely useful. One is a policy challenge. So by that, what I mean is, is there something that the federal government is doing that doesn't make sense, that is currently a, a policy barrier to this happening in the world, or something that we should be doing? So for example, at least anecdotally, we've gotten a lot of information around, for example, the intersection between computer science and career and technical education where in some states and districts, you know, teachers who are interested on the, under the CTE system and being able to teach the new AP course might not be able to do it. It's like an open question that we are trying to figure out as to how much of that is a regulatory barrier versus just something that people perceive. So one is, is there some policy challenge? Some of that is funding, and that's something that we are definitely out there on the record on and hope to work with our congressional partners on securing funding. I think a second idea is what are important uh, 
partnerships that need to be happening out there in the world. You know, when the president says we should be, this, has, this really needs to be an all hands on deck effort. You know, we often engage in these open conversations where people say, well, if only X and Y got together. Um, at the same time, lots of times organizations are coming to us and saying, how can we be helpful? So we can at least say, hey, well, there's an organization that was just talking about you all uh, and would love to work with you. And you know, to the extent that it makes, we're happy to connect folks. And then third is, you know, what are the important messages that we need to be communicating through the agencies, through the White House? And you know, it came out of the work that you all have been doing that the president has really been talking about how this is a really important and essential skill. So those are some of the ways that we sort of engage in it. And we're always happy to get feedback on all three. I would say the first one is the most important one, which is, you know, articulating an actual area where we are, uh, where we can change policy that can have a real impact or uh, can be immensely useful. And we'll only get that from talking to folks who are working on the ground and sort of articulating those challenges. So I would say those are some of our three areas. Um, Mandana, what, you know, you sort of mentioned this collaboration piece. You know, what are your thoughts for how we could have a conversation around how somebody in this room could say, you know, I would love to work with X person in this room on Y idea or how, we wanna, how you want to sort of engender some collaboration talk right in front of this room. Let's start right here. Let's you know, do it right here or afterwards, just pick up the phone. You know, we had an opportunity to introduce ourselves. The attendee list has also been published. Um, if there is ways in which it would help if we did our research and looked into what each other are doing and then collaborate and start working actively. I mean, I, I, I saw that there's Trish, there's Tammy, you know, there's representatives from different states. How can we, how, have one, how has one state accomplished it? Let's learn from each other and let's try to collaborate from that point of view as well. And then there's the organizations that work on diversity, there's the organizations that are uh, trying, to research, trying to bring in more research or evidence-based curriculum. Um, I'm sure there are ways in which I've always been curious, uh, are we comparing notes? Are we looking at data from each other? Right. Um, whether it is assessments of PD or assessments eventually of students to see if they are actually learning something. Right. Uh, and I don't think we are there yet. Right. Uh, but certainly it is, it is a starting point where we should be considering uh, these things. Well, so why don't we use that? So sometimes the thought exercise that's useful for folks is uh, saying, what do you think that is currently missing that should be happening? And especially when you have this kind of super knowledge in a room like this, somebody might be like, well, actually, that is happening. You know, it's like the famous quote, uh, it's not that, uh, uh, you know, it's not happening, it's just not happening enough or everywhere. So, and so it might be that we could have the cross learning happen right there. So, who wants to volunteer something that they wish was happening in the CS space, whether it's in their state, in their community, in their community of practice, that they either they want to work on or they think someone should work on. Who wants to volunteer? And then maybe people can dovetail off that. Yes, sir. I think computer science should count as a science in high school or count as a math in high school so that the kids who are uh, AP driven will end up taking it. It's not true in our state. So, and, and you're talking about the state requirements or the higher ed system attached to the state? State requirements across the country, many, many right. states do not count it as either a science or a math. Right. And, it's a and there's been a sea change just, here from 11 states to 29. So that's like a great one. Uh, any thoughts on that particular? And we'll keep going, sort of stacking through. Yes, sir. Um, I forcefully and strenuously object to that. Um, well, let's just put it this way. If, if we think what Al Gore had to say is reasonable, how can you possibly substitute science and mathematics with computer science? You need it all. And I just don't want us going there because we need a well-educated population, period. Um, it's, it's, anyway, um, so, there's something else so, I want to... So we're going we're gonna to get... Yeah, so, yeah, so, so, well, I, I think his point is to make computer science mandatory. Yeah, like, that's it, what you're it, saying. Like, so, I mean, Not to sacrifice. Right. Yeah. We, I don't want to sacrifice... Their, here's a problem. The stuff that mattered back when I was in high school in the 1970s and early 1980s, that stuff still matters now. Okay, I don't know what we're supposed to substitute computer science for. I'm not sure we're actually the right group to make that decision. What's clear is we need it. And that's, the way, that's kind of how I'd like us to focus. And I think that if there's one thing I'd like to see, it would be for this community to communicate very clearly what it means by the value proposition of computer science in the education system, make sure it's consistently communicated across the country so you know, we talk about the big ideas that we want to have delivered. We don't talk about languages of big ideas. We talk about, you know, say, iteration, recursion, whatever you happen to like. And we're consistent about it so people understand us. Because people outside this room don't understand us. Um, there was a big committee that was put together of high school teachers back in 2008 to go and you know, be a leadership cohort 
and sort this stuff out. And we're, you know, we're eight years later, and we still don't have a unifying message, and we need to have a unifying message. Great. So why don't we keep collecting things that people think are missing, and then we'll do a round of people who think they can help pick up one of those things and help on it. Yeah. Sir. This is um, Alberto Avalos, the Hispanic Heritage Foundation. Just one other, just kind of to add to that, I think in addition to the math and science piece, I, at the Hispanic Heritage Foundation, we very much believe that it should even count as or with as a second language, right? So as another language within schools, so much that our initiative is called Code as a Second Language. So it's, that, that's just kind of adding to that piece as well. Okay, okay. Alice, so do so you I, I know this is an area, I just sort of flag for people who are not super up on this. This is an area of continuous conversation for the community as to where it counts and how it counts. And, uh, but I think, you know, most people sort of at least connect up on access and opportunity. So uh, that's, that is one area where a lot of people connect. Yes, sir. So two thoughts. Yes. Uh, the first is that it's wonderful that we're talking about CS for all. And it's wonderful that we're racing ahead to train teachers. But there's a lot of people for whom we have no idea how to make CS ed work. So if it's for all, what does it mean in special ed, for example? So one thing I'd love to see is research that's about sort of intersectional needs of different populations if we're serious about all people learning computer science. Great. So research different populations. The other thing that I'd love to see is, uh, I'd spend a bunch of time and I counted, I went to every university I could find. As far as I know, there are four tenure line education professors in the entire United States who do CS education research. And ed schools are lagging in terms of wanting to bring this in house. So one thing that could be amazingly transformative would be endowed professorships at top ed schools, or even not top ed schools, really trying to bring faculty into schools of education to do work in this area. That's great. That's great. So uh, why don't we keep collecting, and then I, I'm going to call on Jan, because I think you guys fund uh, Access and CS. So what, why don't you start, and then we'll go with Ruth. So uh, first, just one sentence about this whole what should it count as thing. One of the things I hate about the 21st century is that it's become impossible to offer kids an educational experience unless you make it mandatory. Because there's so much that's mandatory that uh, we're crowding out. Um, you know, so for example, uh, take art, which is not our subject. Um, nobody ever suggested that art should be mandatory. They just offered it, and kids took it. And it's hard to do that these days. And that's why we find ourselves trying to slice out pieces of other people's turf in order to make CS mandatory. I hate that. OK. Um, what I really wanted to talk about, though, is curriculum development. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of self-interested in this, because it's what I am doing these days. Um, there's a lot of money going into uh, teacher professional development. Um, I'm spending some of that money, and it's a great thing, and we need it. Um, but the teacher professional development is less useful if the curriculum that we're giving them is stuff that um, some college professors did in their spare time, um, in, and it's intended for high school kids. Um, so that was how our curriculum got started. It was something that Dan and I did, you know, in our spare time. And it worked great as a course for Berkeley undergraduates. And we're finding that to get it into high schools, we are forming a partnership um, <laughs> with professional, <laughs> professional curriculum developers at uh, EDC, which is a nonprofit that does that. Um, and that side of our work is starving for money. We have some from Jan, um, but it's like way not enough for reasons that I'm not going to bore you with. But I just wanted to say to this group that if you think about leverage, you know, the great thing about teaching teachers is that the teachers then teach a lot of kids and you get leverage by doing that. Curriculum developers have more leverage than anybody. And we need curriculum that is professionally studied by professional uh, educational developers and researchers for work with a diverse population. And um, more money should be going into that. Great. Ruth. Yeah, so um, one of the big issues for minority populations and 
underserved youth is that they access the internet on phones. And um, the vast majority of the online experiences we're all creating and these great things that are being created can't be used very well on a small screen, nor can the kids afford the data. And so I would really like to see all these um, phone companies step up. This is happening in the developing world where phone providers are giving certain content data free. So if we could come up with some partnership with the phone companies where they, like AT&T for example, and they say, okay, if you're gonna access Khan Academy on, on your phone, it's free. So um, I'd like to see some work go into creating resources that work on, on mobile devices so that those kids can get that access and then figure out a way to get them the data that they need to be able to do that. That's great. Let's keep collecting. Who else? We have a question over here. Let's just first, do you want to? Why don't we, who hasn't spoken yet? Alice. Yes. So I just wanted to build on what we were talking about over here with you know how do we leverage and keep it going and I think one of the things that we really need to think about is sustainability and supporting those teachers so one of the things that we do when we work with a school is to say we want at least two teachers in that high school so that they can support each other but I think it goes beyond just that high school um, I know we have Mark here from the CSTA but figuring out how we can help support and build that community of teachers and support the CSTA and other organizations that are trying to do that so that they feel like they're part of something and that they continue to stay and once we've trained them stay in computer science and stay invested. That's great. Jim, and then we'll go back and then come over here. So a couple of ideas raised here. One is um, the importance of mandating as a way of ensuring that um, this actually gets delivered. <coughs> We're also aware that there's huge resistance to mandates all across the country. Um, secondly, there's also tons of issues around should this come from math, should it come from science, should it be uh, included as one of the math courses required for graduation. We're experiencing very strong pushback from the university saying they need everything that's been proposed for high school math and science, and in addition to that, computer science, if they want to be computer science majors. So it seems to me one of the things we might want to simultaneously pursue are demand-driven strategies and provide some funding for that as a potential alternative to these battles that we're all encountering, both in terms of mandates and trying to squeeze um, computer science into math and science. And by we, you're saying Massachusetts, right? Uh, we, but I'll, others, yes. Yeah, that's great. Back there, and then we can catch a few more, and then we're going to come around. Thanks. I think um, we need some clarity for teachers and educators who really want to embrace CS for All and do something in their schools. And there's so many programs, and there's so many um, boot camps, and there's so many things going on, and they have absolutely nowhere to start, and they have no way to vet what's out there. And I think um, they really need some guidance. We need some repository that has information about each of these opportunities or curriculum or programs. It needs to have um, information about what populations they've been tried with, what their learning outcomes are, whether there's research or not, a real searchable database that they can then go in and make some real informed decisions because there's momentum, but then they don't know what to do with it. That's great. Suzanne. So I'm saying this um, from my position at Girl Scouts of the USA, but I'm also saying it in terms of other informal education associations, which is um, it would be great if we had curriculum that and program that a volunteer could be trained fairly easily to do and to deliver to girls in our case that would not be as rigorous as what we're talking about here in terms of being in school and being counted as, as prerequisites or anything but could spark the interest and also something that would be for younger girls uh, again speaking for girl scouts most of our girls are kindergarten through fifth grade so that's a real strong place to get girls interested and have them ready to move on um, and a, we need something that is just maybe a little bit less rigorous or less difficult to deliver than what can be done in a professional school setting with professional development. Awesome. All right, great. Did we, why don't we do this and then we'll come around because Mark, some we five minutes heads up. Okay, so let's collect and then we're gonna do like a little bit of, I wanna make sure Vandana has a chance to sort of reflect on some of the feedback. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Ani Yadav. Uh, so I'm one of the four tenured faculty in College of Education that work in CS Ed. So we, we do exist. Um, Spotting like a wild tiger. <laughs> so I think teacher professional development is important, the, the, most of the work that's being done right now. But long term, I see pre-service teacher education needs to play a huge role to develop that pipeline of teachers who teach computer science. But in the last decade, the teaching profession has been demonized so much 
In 2004, 11% of incoming freshmen wanted to major in education to become a teacher. This year, it's 4%. Given that 40 to 50% of teachers leave the profession in four to five years, uh, attrition, you know, we need to fix how we talk about teachers and the policies around teacher evaluation has had some unintended consequences because teachers don't get paid enough and now there's no respect as well. So I think pre-service teacher has to be a part of that conversation. And at MSU, uh, we've seen we're number one teacher ed program in the country with elementary and secondary and we have about 40% decline in, in enrollment in the last decade. So. Hmm. Ryan. Hi, I'm Ryan, founder of CodeNow, and so we work with CodeNow, and so we work with students out of school, and there's a lot of other programs in the space, but there's no collaboration. And so what would be amazing to see is if there's some type of handoff from organization to organization to create a, uh, a full pipeline for students. So here's the entry point, and then this organization does this really well and this well. Um, some type of collaborative effort would be really amazing to see because there's a lot of great work being done, but nobody's really talking. Awesome. Uh, yes, why don't we go? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So I'm Servan from Code for Fun. Uh, one, two things. One uh, that we cannot find for sure is time. So uh, over and over again, what I see and when I talk to um, to school districts is that they ask, but I mean, we know computer science is important, but we don't have the time. Uh, so to back up a little bit on what we were saying about. Uh, finding some credits, it's great, but what if it was not science and computer and then let's add in other mandatory things? Can we integrate computer science? And computer science is just a tool to do things, so let's just be it. Let's just be a tool to learn math, a tool to learn science, and I'm sure we can find creative way. And so that goes back to like, how do we co uh, create curriculums? Uh, can we not create cur curriculums that are only for computer science? Could we cre create curriculum that also is going to count for science? And the second thing is to back up on uh, what the, the um, gentleman was saying, sorry, um, is that yes, the, comp the teachers are not paid enough. And if you're going to tackle computer science, there's a lot of very well paid jobs out there. And I come from the corporate world and not a lot of people are going to quit and they're very cushiony jobs and, and decide to teach because you know, you're not going to make those figures. So we have to incentivize people to want to do this but also recognize the people who are already doing it and, and, and keep them. Great, so let's just do quickly once one or two sentences and then we'll come back to Vandana. Uh, so the one missing piece is our future employers, uh, technology companies and how we get them involved. Uh, a lot of it is how do you work with tech companies to provide project-based learning and the application of computer sciences? Um, how do we expose them to uh, software engineers who are working at companies, and especially in the LA area like Snapchat, um, Riot Games, IBM, Microsoft. Um, uh, I represent the Los Angeles Area Ch Chamber of Commerce and we work with 1,600 member companies throughout the LA area. And one of the projects we've been working on is developing career uh, pathways into technology jobs. And so when we first started a year and a half ago, we didn't have really a lot of companies that we're working with. And now we're working with 40 tech companies who at any given time are participating in guest speaking opportunities, working on project base, inviting students to take company tours. And that has really helped our CS students really understand and get excited about uh, what they're learning in the classroom. Great. Sir. So I'm worried about the safety net for kids who don't have any CS teacher. As much as we try to get to all these teachers, as much as so many of us are working on this space, what happens when a kid really wants CS and has nobody there in their entire school that can help them? Is there a space for this? So I think for enough for asking this question and kind of starting the, the ball rolling. I think there's a space, MOOCs don't really work for kids who aren't autodidacts. So what can you have to supplement the learning so that kids can actually succeed at these courses that may be remote and online, but have some kind of maybe a Saturday, maybe after school, maybe something where there's an online community of kids who are also going through the same course. Some way to make that successful for kids who have no CS in their schools. That's great, sir. So, um, so the, the, uh, the, the conversation about after school uh, programs is, I think, great. But, um, but the, and, and in response to the comment that came from the back there, um, after school programs are nice to begin engagement. But unless there's actually something in the school that continues that, that, that engagement uh, may actually have a, a bad effect. I mean, if student gets engaged, gets all excited, but doesn't have anything to follow through, that, that actually can be worse because now you've just you know, excited somebody 
and don't have anything to follow through on, perhaps that person will just give up and never come back to it, right? So, so it's, it's um, after school programs and, and supplementary programs um, should really be that, right? It's really supplementing what happens in the classroom as opposed to just being them by themselves. All right, we have final two and then we wanna make sure. Yeah, okay. I always feel bad. I wanted to speak for, when you talk of computer science about early access, so I think we need to look at K-8, not just K-12. Right. Because I think K-8, the earlier you can engage them, treat it as a tool. So if you're learning, teaching them how to do English or math, we don't take them to an after-school class and hope they learn. Great. We teach them English, we teach them math. So awesome. at a K-5 or a K-8 level, it's possible, and that's what we should be doing. All right, Karen's stopping us off. Plus one to the complex curriculum, love it. Plus one to the inclusion and everybody. Um, we would love to work with whoever out there would like to be issuers of credentials for computer science. It's something that's missing in most states. We are looking for people who are the branded, like who would, because teachers would love to have, you know, credentials from various organizations. So definitely drop me a card, let me know if you're interested. Vandana. First of all, are you sure the clock is correct? Did 45 minutes really go by that quickly? <laughs> Because I started scribbling here thinking, and then I made a mess of my own notes. So I have to make sense out of this now. Um, but I think what we are hearing, the most important thing that we heard is, um, there is no doubt we all want computer science. Um, but we are still struggling to find the right place for computer science. Should it be counted as math or science credit? Should it be mandatory? Should it be an integrative approach into various subjects? Which, by the way, is an excellent idea. I know that Alan Kay would support that. Um, but beyond that, I think there are the challenges of bringing computer science in whatever flavor we do in a school. Um, we saw some amazing exchange of ideas here on what needs to be done next. We need to constantly work on curriculum development, as Brian was saying, uh, because that is the heart of the matter. That is what we are teaching our students. So we need to make sure that that is done right. Uh, and thank you, NSF, for supporting all the evidence-based research around that. Um, for those of you who are coming from nonprofits that support boot camps and hackathons, what we are hearing is that, um, you know, as you said, um, what is the next step after you have, you know, sparked their curiosity if the school doesn't offer? So perhaps uh, someone back there had mentioned a repository of re resources or perhaps a pathway program uh, that would enable uh, someone has to step up and put all this together for organizations and for students to be able to take that. And then weaving that into Ruth's point that perhaps we need to be looking at partnerships with phone companies and data companies to possibly make that kind of information and learning free um, when students are trying to download that. That's a great idea, by the way. Um, uh, what else? Uh, we need to include special needs people. As the gentleman was saying, I don't think for computer science anyone has actively sought that area of research. Um, Schools of education, eventually teacher training should be done by schools of education, but what are we really doing about it? Uh, you know, this idea about perhaps setting up endowed computer science chairs in schools of education could be an uh, interesting lead in that direction. Um, early access, we need to support that actively. Uh, we need to catch them young, as we all know, uh, and expose them to computer science. Um, and then on funding, I think we talked about that actively what people look for is sustainable, scalable, and creative ways um, of collaborating and bringing new partnerships. Did I cover That's great. everything? That's great. <laughs> and then, you know, you should all know, obviously, if, if there are folks in this room that you have listened to, you want to follow up with, if you don't catch them at the end of this session, go bother Kostov. He has, he both knows everybody uh, <laughs> and has all their contact info. So. He will be a great resource, so both for follow-up. Uh, I want to thank this team for putting this together and all of you for your amazing ideas. Thank you.